The land is peaceful now. The rolling hills and quietly flowing streams of this fertile valley belie its special place in American history, revealing little of the carnage which occurred here more than 200 years ago during one of the largest and deadliest clashes of our War of Independence, the Battle of Brandywine. The roar of musket and cannon fire thundered across the Brandywine Valley on September 11, 1777, shattering the sultry morning calm with the menacing sounds of war. From dawn to dusk, in searing heat and blinding gun smoke, English, German, and American soldiers struggled desperately for victory. The fate of the colonial capital in Philadelphia hanging in the balance. Outmanned and outmaneuvered, General George Washington and his army of citizen soldiers fought valiantly. But by day's end, the battlefield strewn with thousands of dead or wounded soldiers, Washington and his Continental Army were forced to retreat. Washington's attempt to save Philadelphia failed, but the Americans succeeded in a crucial goal. They fought the British on their own terms and when outmaneuvered, withdrew in good order to fight again. For seven generations, the settlers of colonial America considered themselves loyal British subjects. They enjoyed considerable freedom, being governed by the British crown some 3,000 miles away. After 1763, however, the British Parliament reached across the ocean and passed a series of laws increasing its control over the prosperous 13 colonies. Many Americans strongly opposed the new laws, especially new taxes. American demands for a greater voice in their own government angered the British. In 1775, Britain formally declared Massachusetts, which had been a hotbed of public protest, to be in rebellion. The British government ordered its Boston troops to put down all acts which defied the crown. Fighting soon erupted at Lexington and Concord. The Revolutionary War had begun. The conflict would last eight years, claiming thousands of lives and leading eventually to the birth of a new nation, the United States of America. For the Brandywine Valley colonists, everyday life was little affected by Britain's oppressive trade and tax laws. The people of 18th century Chadsford enjoyed considerable prosperity from their fertile land. This peaceful Quaker community of farmers, craftsmen, and artisans produced an abundance of food and manufactured goods, enough to supply themselves, other colonies, and overseas markets. Among the first settlers of the region were farmer Joseph Gilpin, his wife Hannah, and their 15 children. Although the Gilpins had immigrated to America for religious freedom, they continued to think of themselves as loyal Englishmen. Benjamin Ring, with his family of 10, was a miller and farmer living near Chadsford in 1777. The Gilpin and Ring houses reflected the colonists' increasing prosperity and were typical of many homes in the region. Both family homesteads would prove important in the battle to come. The Gilpins and the Rings were Quakers, also known as Friends, a Protestant religion founded during the English Civil War over a century before. Their religious faith prevented them from bearing arms against anyone, based on the belief that God is within each of us. The Quakers faced a dilemma. Most were sympathetic to the American cause and believed the actions of England were immoral. But Friends weren't convinced that armed revolution was the solution. They tried to remain neutral in all matters relating to war, which they believed was a sin against God. The choice between loyalty or liberty through armed rebellion was a hard one for Americans to make, but especially difficult for the pacifist Quakers. The 
The conflict with Britain had been expanding for two years when war suddenly came to the banks of the Brandywine River in 1777. Seizing Philadelphia, the capital of the newly formed nation, and the birthplace of the Declaration of Independence was the goal of the main British army under General Sir William Howe. Howe believed that capturing the city would not only demoralize the Patriot cause, but split the colonies and secure for the crown a region rich in food and manufactured goods. Alexander Hamilton, an aide to America's General George Washington, was well aware of what the loss of Philadelphia would mean to the American cause. Philadelphia has long been the main source of supplies toward the war, and getting it into their possession would deprive us of a wheel we could very badly spare in the great political and military machine. General Howe's battle plan to capture Philadelphia called for a surprise attack on the colonial capital from the southwest. This led to his confrontation with American soldiers in the Brandywine Valley. His powerful army numbered 5,000 German Hessians and 13,000 British troops. For General Washington, the Eastern Heights rising sharply above the Brandywine River offered his troops an excellent defensive position, a natural moat with advantageous high ground behind. There, the Patriots assembled their largest fighting force to date, almost 15,000 men, including many untested in 18th century warfare. Foreign officers served among the Continentals. Foremost among those, a 19-year-old wealthy French volunteer with a zest for liberty, the Marquis de Lafayette. His and his country's contribution would prove critical to the American cause. I leave that to the fates of tomorrow. Indeed, sir. On the morning of September 9th, Washington summoned his generals to his headquarters at the Ring House to plan the deployment of their troops. He positioned the American army on the heights east of the Brandywine River, guarding the main fords, shallow places where the enemy could cross the river. Troops stood watch for two days, from Buffington's Ford to the north to Pyle's Ford to the south. Washington expected to clash with the British at Chad's Ford, where the main road between Philadelphia and Baltimore crossed the Brandywine. And it was here he posted the main strength of his army. He was confident the area was secure, a decision he would soon regret. <laughs> Meanwhile, the British gathered at Kennett Square to formulate their strategy. We have the rebels under control, the rabble that they are. General Howe planned a pincers movement, which had worked against the Americans before. One column of 7,000 soldiers would march directly on Chad's Ford to attack Washington's main forces and pin them in place. The rest of the British Army would move in a wide flanking movement north, moving quietly 17 miles to cross the Brandywine above the fords Washington guarded and launch a surprise attack on the right flank of the Continental Army. On September 11, 1777, the harvest-ready farms of Brandywine were about to become fields of death. A heavy, dense fog provided cover for the approaching British troops. When the fog lifted, the sun blazed and temperatures soared. Humidity, heat haze, and dust blanketed the area, adding to the misery of soldiers on both sides. During the early morning hours, General Howe ordered Hessian General Wilhelm von Nipphausen to launch an all-out attack down the main road toward Washington's positions at Chad's Ford. Nipphausen's troops included a company armed with the new rapid-firing breech-loading rifles invented by their commander, Major Patrick Ferguson. Meanwhile, Howe led General Charles Cornwallis and his main force upstream to cross at the unguarded fords above the forks of the Brandywine. Vicious fighting raged throughout the day as both sides stood shoulder to shoulder, facing each other, 80 to 150 yards apart, trading three shots a minute, then charging with fixed bayonets. Charge!
Conflicting and confusing information plagued General Washington throughout the day. Reports from the front lines first suggested that General Howe had split his forces. Later messages both confirmed and denied these reports. But Washington persisted with his battle plan, convinced that the British were launching their entire force against his line at Chad's Ford. Meanwhile, Howe and the majority of his troops continued their march north, crossing the river at an unprotected ford and outflanking the Americans before they had a chance to position and defend themselves. By mid-afternoon, they secured a commanding position near the Birmingham Friends Meeting House. Prepare to charge! As the British came eye to eye with the American soldiers in the charge! right flank, Washington realized he had been outmaneuvered by General Howe. In a desperate attempt to turn the battle, he commanded his army to take the high ground around the Birmingham Friends Meeting House. But the British already held that position. After a long, blistering day of bloodshed, the reality of defeat began to pierce American dreams of victory. It's for your own good, lad. It's for your own good, lad. It's steady. It's for the cause, lad. It's for the cause. American casualties were staggering. Nearly 1,200 killed and wounded Patriot soldiers scattered the battlefield where they fell. Over 300 Americans were taken prisoner. The British officially listed 600 men killed or wounded, but later reports suggested heavy losses closer to 2,000, 15% of their total army. France's Marquis de Lafayette fought courageously, rallying American troops even while he was wounded. His gallant conduct made him a hero to soldiers and a favorite with Washington. As dusk fell on the Brandywine Valley, the guns fell silent. Polish Count Kazimierz Pulaski organized a cavalry screen to protect the beleaguered American troops as they retreated to the city of Chester, some 12 miles to the east. General Howe and his exhausted troops camped on the battlefield. They had a meager victory feast of cold pork and grog, then spent the next few days caring for the wounded, burying the dead, and resupplying. British Captain John Andre wrote in his journal, Night and the fatigue the soldiers had undergone prevented any pursuit. The defeat at Brandywine did not demoralize the colonial soldiers. They believed the loss wasn't because of their fighting abilities, but rather poor knowledge of the terrain and bad intelligence. Taking pen in hand, General Washington wrote to Congress, Notwithstanding the misfortune of the day, I am happy to find the troops in good spirits. For the residents of the Brandywine Valley, the battle took a disastrous toll. The British looted livestock, food, clothes, books, furnishings, and money from many homesteads. The Ring House was especially hard hit since it served as Washington's quarters before the battle. Both armies ransacked neighboring farms, leaving blight in their wake. It would be nearly five years before the community would regain the economic prosperity it enjoyed before the battle. As for the Quakers on September 11th, they simply tried to ignore the horrors waging around them that day. A notation reportedly attributed to a member of the Kent meeting merely states, while there was much noise and confusion without, all was quiet and peaceful within. No further mention of the battle was made. In the days following the Battle of Brandywine, General Howe resumed his campaign for Philadelphia. On September 26th, British soldiers marched unopposed into the colonial capital Howe's presence in Philadelphia allowed a smaller American army in New York to win a resounding victory at Saratoga, a success which convinced France that the Americans could win the war. France joined the war against Britain, and in the end, that alliance would help tip the scale in favor of the Patriots. 
Four years after the campaign of 1777, the main British army, commanded by General Cornwallis, surrendered to Washington at Yorktown, Virginia. That defeat led the British government to begin peace negotiations. And in 1783, the Treaty of Paris brought an end to the war. After eight long years, the struggle for independence was over and a new nation was born. The bitter seeds of initial defeat had spawned a determination to hold on to the dream of liberty through hardship and battle. For the residents of the rural Brandywine Valley, the destruction and poverty resulting from the Battle of Brandywine proved temporary. Their community's pride and patriotism was evident 50 years later in celebrations marking the return of a major American hero, the Marquis de Lafayette and his son, George Washington Lafayette. Today, the 10 square miles where the Battle of Brandywine was fought is honored as a national historic landmark, the federal government's highest designation. The state of Pennsylvania declared the Brandywine battlefield its first Commonwealth treasure, a rare memorial not only to the state's heritage, but to our nation's struggle for self-government. It is here that present and future generations can remember the brave men and women of our past who volunteered their lives and their fortunes in the never-ending defense of freedom. <laughs>